Hello everyone, this is Andre, the co-founder of Twins Tours and Travel in Jerusalem in Israel, born into a Christian Maronite family, and I'm a licensed tour guide and an ordained minister of the gospel. I have been leading numerous groups throughout the Holy Land for almost 20 years. Also, I'm an author of several books, and you can find them in Amazon. And one of the first books I wrote called One Friday in Jerusalem speaks about my life story. So join me for a journey of 10 days to understand the heart and the mind of Jesus and to understand the Bible in a deeper way with more details through the Middle Eastern perspective. Please share this podcast with your friends and families and churches and connect with me if you have any questions. Welcome to day number 8, which we will learn about crucifixion. All the group are sitting on the steps facing the main facade of the Holy Sepulchre Church. And we will read and learn today from Matthew 27 verses 45 to 56. Let me read it for you. The Death of Jesus From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema shabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why you have forsaken me. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Verse 48, Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. 51. At the moment, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Verse 54 When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Verse 55 Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalena, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's son. In ancient history, crucifixion was considered one of the most brutal and shameful ways of death, probably originating with the Assyrians and Babylonians' invasion. They would hang people on poles. Later, it was used systematically by the Persians in the 6th century BC. Alexander the Great also brought it to the eastern Mediterranean countries in the 4th century BC. Also, the Phoenicians introduced it to Rome in the 3rd century BC. The Romans perfected crucifixion for 500 years until it was abolished by Emperor Constantine in the 4th century AD. Crucifixion in Roman times was applied mostly to slaves, disgraced soldiers, Christians, and foreigners, only very rarely to Roman citizens. Death on the cross usually took the time between 6 hours to 4 days. It depends on the after effects of forced scourging, wounds, hemorrhage, and dehydration causing shock and pain. But the most important factor was progressive breathing complications. Death was probably commonly due to cardiac arrest caused by severe pain, body blows, and breaking of the legs, the large bones above the knees. The attending Roman guards could only leave the site after the victim had died. Then a spear stab wounds into the heart, or sharp blows to the front of the chest, 
or a smoking fire built at the foot of the cross to suffocate the victim. This is the ways the Romans crucified people. There was a skeleton found in 1968 in a hill near Jerusalem of a crucified body also revealed that the nails probably did not go through the palm as is typical of what we see in the movies or in the icons but through the wrist also legs of the body were tied up because the man was crucified on an olive tree it's too short and not very high from the ground not like how the movies make it and glorifies the cross some evidence shows that Jesus may not have been crucified in a wooden cross but instead on a tree with a wooden crossbar look what Josephus Flavius the famous Jewish historian tell us that under the Romans all the trees that lined the roads were used for crucifixion this made the death very public Pilate liked crucifying the Jews on trees because this made them cursed in their own religion. Look what is written in Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, verse 23, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is a curse of God, so that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. So, let's get back to the point and start reading from Matthew 27, verse 45. It is now the sixth hour, which is noontime. A strange darkness falls over all the land until the ninth hour. Ninth hour is three o'clock in the afternoon. But the key here is strange darkness falls. So Jesus was on the cross from the sixth hour till the ninth hour, which means from noon, 12 till 3 p.m. Three hours. This means he was not long or had a lot of time hanged on the tree. Why? The Romans wanted him to be dead as soon as possible before Shabbat starts, to have time to bury him. The darkness, the airy darkness, is not caused by a solar eclipse, as many scholars speculate. The darkness occurs at the time of the new moon, and the time of the new moon is the same time of the Passover season. This is why when they know this is the Passover. And this is when they do the sacrifice, when the moon is full. And this darkness lasts much longer than the few minutes of an eclipse. So God has allowed this darkness. And also if you think very deeply and spiritually... The darkness symbolizes wickedness, symbolizes Satan is in control. If we see the context, Satan and all demons were rejoicing in what appeared to be this victory over Jesus when he was hanged on the cross or crucified on a tree. Imagine how many times did Satan try to kill Jesus from the moment he was born till the moment hanged on the tree? When Jesus was born, God prepared the lowest and important people in the community of that day, the shepherds, to welcome him. Satan had no way of seeing the angels that appeared to these shepherds that night or hearing the clues on how to find the baby. Later, after Joseph had moved his little family to Bethlehem, where they lived for around two years, a caravan of wise men arrived in Jerusalem, 
following that famous star, and they went to King Herod's palace and naively announced their search for the one born king of the Jews. Herod said that he was pleased to hear of this great event and wanted to know where they found him and report back so that he too could go and worship this king. Of course, he was a liar and was a tool in the hands of Satan to kill the Christ child. The Magi's went on and found the child in Bethlehem and gave him those rich gifts of frankincense, gold, and mirth. They departed and Joseph and Mary heard of the decree of Herod to kill all the children of Bethlehem in hopes of killing baby Jesus. Joseph took the rich gifts and financed a sudden trip to Egypt, escaping the hand of Satan's servant, King Herod. Also in scripture, Matthew chapter 4 verse 9, at the temptation of Jesus, Satan attempted to hinder God's plan by having Jesus worship him. Look what the verse says. And he said unto him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus, of course, refused and Satan was again defeated. Also another time in Nazareth, when the angry religious Jewish leaders attempted to throw Jesus off the cliff after his bold proclamation that he is the anointed one, he is the Messiah. That took place in the Nazareth synagogue. You can read later Luke chapter 4 verses 16 to 30. Also another time when Peter attempted to get Jesus to bypass the cross, Jesus rebuked him and declared that Satan was behind that talk. Matthew 16, 22 and 23. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God, forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So we realize that there were so many times Satan wanted to kill Jesus. And actually his plan to kill him was 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, during all Jesus' life from birth till the moments he is on the cross, Satan wanted to kill Jesus. And this is the peak on the cross when Satan thought he would win over him and kill him that is the peak reached during those three hours of darkness during these three hours satan thought he's in control when satan thought he is powerful and even if i want to stretch you more from the beginning of humanity from adam and eve satan wanted to fail god's plan on earth so this darkness for three hours is a very deep spiritual time in history where Satan thought he was in control. Let us continue to learn and read from verse 46 and understand about Jesus' last sentence on the cross. For me, as a local indigenous Christian, I know many languages. I know the Hebrew, I know the Aramaic, and I know the Arabic. So I will teach you the sentence Jesus said or pronounced from his own mouth in Aramaic. So we're going to learn together today the exact sentence Jesus pronounced from his own mouth. So I'm going to teach you how to pronounce this important sentence that Jesus spoke before his death and explain about it. Verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima shabaktani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I just want to tell you a point which we're going to discuss and learn about. The Father never forsakes the Son. To make it clear, the Father 
never forsake us. But let me explain more. Eli, Eli, Lima Shabaktani, if you can pronounce it in Aramaic. This is very powerful. This sentence I am teaching you, Jesus spoke it from his own mouth. So you're going to repeat with me the same sentence Jesus spoke in the cross with his local language, Aramaic. Eli, Eli, Lima Shabaktani. This is in Aramaic. Now I'm going to teach you the same verse in Arabic. Ilahi, Ilahi, Limaza Siptani. Ilahi, Ilahi means God, God. Limaza means why. Siptani left me. And now I'm going to teach you this sentence in Hebrew. Repeat after me. Elohai, Elohai, Lama, Azavtani. Again. Elohai, Elohai, Lama, Azavtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, Jesus is quoting the Aramaic at this moment rather than the Hebrew because that was his lunga franca that was his daily language that was his language as a person as a human in the flesh this is why he chose Aramaic and also because of the people around him to understand why he said that sentence let me explain for you the context more. Jesus meant to say, this is known from Psalm 22, in the context and the culture, he is saying, my God, my God, this is the moment I was spared to. This is my destiny. It's done. In other words, I had done what you asked me to do. Jesus was not complaining to the Father, as the translation makes it in English, or Western interpretations make it. He even shouted, finished, it's done. The translations say, finished, the original Hebrew. But in fact, he shouted out loud, I made it. In other words, my mission on earth is complete. The Father was with him all the time and never left him. It is not a lack of faith statement. He is affirming his faith to his Father by accomplishing his mission on earth. This is what Jesus cried out at the peak of his pain. These specific words are the beginning of a very important psalm, Psalm 22. This is the most famous psalm that talks about the suffering of Christ. Note, when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, Lima Shabaktani, he was telling the crowds and his family and everyone around him to recite this psalm with him. That was the culture at that time. Even on the cross, on the last moments of his life on earth, Jesus was reciting the psalms. He was a teacher. And when Jesus was reciting the psalm, he will not mention the psalm number 22 like we have today. In the first century, Jews knew all the Psalms by heart. They had no numbers. And Jesus only starts with the beginning of the Psalm, the first sentence. This is the introductory sentence. So the Jews knew the Psalms by its first sentence. And they will repeat and recite with Jesus this Psalm. So the people around him knew exactly what Jesus was talking about or what he was referring to. 
And when they were reciting the psalm, they could realize that all of what is written in this specific psalm is happening in front of them. So Jesus is telling the people around him that it's all complete, it's all finished, and this is happening in front of you. Let me read for you the Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? You have to understand that Jesus as human, he's expressing his emotions and feelings towards his creator. Sometimes we feel that God is not listening to us or God left us. It's only a human feeling. And this is, I think, what Jesus was feeling. Look at verse 2. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In your own ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. So Jesus here is telling the Father, I am trusting you completely. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. Verse 7 is important. All who see me mock me. You see how this is a prophecy. They hear insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breasts. Look at verse 10. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouth wide against me. I am proud out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted with me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dog surrounds me. A pack of violence encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Look at verse 18. It's important. It's a prophecy. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. This is important. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So Jesus here is trusting the Father and trusting his life in the hands of the Father. And Jesus knew Later, he's going to be resurrected by the power of the Spirit. And look what verse 25 says. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. Jesus fulfilled all his calling in life and submitted all his 
thoughts and his mind and his cries to the Father. Anyway, the Psalms continues, but I want to tell you that this Psalms end in a positive way. So here, Jesus on the cross, the Father will never forsake the Son. But it was a human cry, Jesus' feelings towards the Father. He was expressing his feelings as a human being on the cross. And Jesus was telling the crowds, this is all happening right now in front of you. And we realize from this psalm that God do not and never leaves us. But we feel sometimes he do. It's only our human feelings. Sometimes we get into distress, we get into really hard time, and we ask God, where are you? Why you are not answering us? Why did you abandon us? But this is our own feeling. That doesn't mean he left us. Let me try to explain for you. When Jesus said in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama shabaktani, what did it mean? Please do not take it literally. Hebrew and Aramaic have multi-levels of meanings and understanding, layers, usually a deeper meaning. Just read between the lines. It's so rich, the context you have to understand of the Jesus on the cross, the culture, the customs are very important. We need to understand that the Father and the Son are one. They do not separate. The Father is always with the Son, and the Son is always with the Father. So this statement that Jesus said is not related to God the Father leaving the Son. It is Jesus' own feelings as a human being on the cross that the Father left him. Jesus is praying as a human to his father. He is expressing his emotions of his life calling. His human side is rising because he is really suffering from the pain, the shame, the mockery. He is expressing his emotions. So Jesus as human here is shouting this psalm out of his own human pain and the father never left him. Jesus as a man, he cried, he fasted, he slept, he laughed. All what we humans do in life, he had done. But what is the difference? He did not sin. We have our basic needs of life. Eat, sleep, drink water. It's very like Jesus. He was so much completely human. But what is different is that he never sent. Many times is mentioned in scripture, Jesus, the son of man, even in his human life on earth, we know that he did not commit any sin at all. He stayed without sin, but had pain, suffered, was mocked, was hungry, he was thirsty. He needed to have these basic needs as a human passing through his life. Like Jesus, always he prayed to the Father. All the time, he had separate time to the Father to pray. And as us, as human on earth, we have to pray to the Father. Jesus had to fast. He had to get baptized. He shared everything with us as humans, except our sinful nature, except sin. Look what is written in Hebrews 4.15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Also another important point. Take into consideration Jesus was a teacher. He started to recite this psalm in front of all his family to teach them. When we are under pressure and suffering, we can express our feelings and emotions and cry out to the Father. And in some moments we say, God, God, why you left us? Why you are not listening to us? And even many times we feel that God abandoned us completely. 
during passing through hard ships. Jesus said it first for us to learn from him when we are suffering and mocked or depressed. What happens? We separate ourselves from everyone. We isolate ourselves. Satan wants us to be isolated because he wants us to make sin. Imagine the three hours of darkness where Jesus was weak. He wants him to sin. All right? To deny his father. Take out your frustrations and cry out loud to God. Talk to him like Jesus done on the cross. He talked to the father. When you are under distress and the breakdown, just shout out, cry out loud and talk to him. Till you calm down. Do you know the Psalms started negative, but it ended positively because God listens to you. Even if you feel he's not there and is not listening. Lord, when people mock me, what to do? When you work among corrupt people in your business or your job in a corrupt world, just show them the love of Christ and do not do the wrong things. Do not sin like that. what they do. Separate yourself from their greed, from the sin, from pride, like Jesus did on the cross. He wants to teach us everything he done and to do the right thing. He stayed righteous till the last moment of his life. And he was righteous among all the corrupt, unjust Roman authority and Roman system. Again, I will challenge you with the same question. Will God leave his only son? Will God ever leave us? When we get sick or get in trouble, we feel that God left us. This is only a feeling, our feelings, our emotions. You know, emotions come and go for a certain reason. That doesn't mean God left us. This is not wrong to feel like that. Jesus himself felt the same. Because it's very hard when you are left alone. Even harder when it comes from your own family, your own brothers, a mother or your father left you, or, or your spouse left you, or even a friend left you. That deeply hurts. Despite the strong faith of the disciples themselves, at one stage, they felt that Jesus left them. Look at pain, the physical, the emotion, the spiritual and let us understand why these moments are important. And let us understand where is God when it hurts so much and he is not answering us. Where is God? I believe everyone in this world will pass through moments in his life when he says, Eli, Eli, lama shabaktani, God, God, why you have forsaken me? Let me explain more from scripture, from the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve. Let me stretch you a little bit. Maybe Adam was thinking and he could told God, why did you leave us to eat from the tree? Why did you allow it to happen? And sometimes we say, why God allow us to do mistakes or do sinful attitudes? Did he leave us? No. God hates sin. This is not his nature. But why did he allow it to happen to us? Because we have complete freedom. Because it's our choice. We choose to sin. It is our own decision. We cannot blame God for every wrong decision we make. He allowed it because we are the problem and he wants to teach us. Why did Cain kill Abel? It was so hard on Adam to see one of his own sons killing his other son. It's very hard. Why did this happen? Sinful reactions, greed, jealousy. Satan wants to destroy God's plan 
from the beginning of creation. Look at Noah and the flood. He cried out to God, why did you leave me alone? Noah was warning the people about the flood coming and they mocked him. He was alone. Why did you not tell the people about the flood? He was saying. God answers because it's their own choice. Noah told them, but the people chose to live in sin. God allowed the flood. He wanted people to repent, but they did not want to repent. Look about Jacob. He cried out to God, why you left me? Jacob, remember, he lost everything, his family, his friends, even his own brother Esau wanted to kill him. And Jacob left to Haran to work for Laban. He wanted to marry Rachel, Rachel, he loved her. And he worked for seven years and Laban tricked him with Leah. So he had to work another seven years. So he worked for 14 years because he loved Rachel. Despite he was always working hard, he was mocked by her father, Laban. And after all these years and hardships, he married Rachel. But what happened? He lost her after she gave birth to Joseph and Benjamin. This is hurts. Why did this happen? Did God leave him? No. Two of the twelve of the tribes of Israel was born. There is always a reason why God allowed things to happen. Why God allowed Joseph to be left deep inside the well alone? He was tricked by his own brothers. It's so hurtful when your own brothers just try to deceive you. Or your own family hates you. They hated Joseph. They were jealous from him. Imagine what did Joseph feel? When he was isolated down in the well, in the pit. Those moments he cried out to God. Where are you God? Why you left me alone? Why you do not hear me? Why you allow this to happen? He thought that God left him. He was so much hurt and abandoned. So it's only a feeling he felt at that moment. It doesn't mean God abandoned him. And look what happened. A caravan passed by and found him and took him to Egypt. And again, he was in Egypt. He was in prison, despite he was innocent. It's like God have left him completely. And probably Joseph was saying all the time, God, God, why you had forsaken me? And remember the famine took place and Joseph had to make key decisions. And his prophecy of the grains and his provision enabled Egypt to survive the famine. Joseph was able to advise Pharaoh on how to prepare for the famine. And as a result, gained the favor of Pharaoh, who promoted him to become a prime minister. So there was a reason. Also, we learn about Moses. Moses said to God, why did you leave me? And let my feelings control me. And remember, Moses overreacted and he killed the Egyptian. Remember the story one day Moses saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite. He got so angry, he killed the Egyptian. And the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, heard that Moses had killed the Egyptian. He said he would have Moses killed too. Moses was afraid. He left Egypt to lead his people to the promised land. God allowed things to happen. Maybe Satan wanted to destroy and kill, but even if Satan wants to destroy, God will use everything to glorify Jesus. Everything happens for a reason. Even if you fall down in sin, God is a redemptive. He wants to redeem you, and he wants to teach us And look at the story of David, the one who wrote the Psalm 22 himself. He is the one who said, God, God, why you had forsaken me? Why I had to run away from my own family and be isolated from my people? Even David said he committed adultery. He was broken. 
when you are the most broken in your life and left alone, your emotions start to rise up and you will start to cry out, where are you, God? I tell you, I, when I was the most broken in my life, and the weakest, and when I cried out to God, why did you leave me? These were the moments when David's destiny started to be shaped. From a smelly shepherd to the king of Israel. There is a calling on his life. There is a calling on your life. If you're passing through hardships, and you felt God left you, it's only a feeling. Because these are the moments when we cry out to God. God, God, why you had forsaken us? Just like Jesus. When Jesus cried out, it is a cry of all the pain of all humanity from Jesus' heart to his Father. Why you left me alone? Why you allowed this to happen? Why you allowed divorce to happen in my family? Why you allowed cancer and diseases to kill my beloved ones? We need to trust in God all the time. There's a reason for everything. We will meet them in heavens. God allowed things to happen, specific things to happen for a reason. And even with the coronavirus today, it happens for a reason. It's a wake-up call for humanity to repent and get near and trust the Father. Do they listen? Do they see it? Do they want to repent? God is giving earth chances. He needs us to repent. Let's continue to verse 48. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The verse refers to wine as wine vinegar. From the original Greek, it means sour wine, which refers to very cheap wine. And this wine apparently was not purchased by the wealthy. It was a sharp, vinegary wine. It was a common wine used simply to quench one's thirst, especially for the people who are on the cross. And we read in John 19, verse 29, he adds that there was a jar of the wine nearby. Let me read it for you. John 19, 29. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. The jar of wine was mostly likely there also maybe to satisfy the thirst of the Roman soldiers and let them escape the intense job they do and feel numb during fulfilling their cruel work. The sour wine was provided also in a long pole with a hyssop sponge on the end. Most likely the sour wine was given as a simple drink for thirsty, dying, suffering men on the cross so that Jesus might more easily or any like thief or any criminal on the cross can endure the pain. So they give them to taste the wine to be numb. But Jesus refused the wine. However, so that he could go through his suffering with a clear conscience. He refused to take that wine. And historically known that the Romans used hyssop sponge in the toilets. That is how Romans would relieve themselves, by wiping with a sponge on a stick, cleaned off in water and kept in a jar of vinegar, now, obviously, we can't absolutely be certain of it. Maybe the sponge on a stick is supposed to be an indication to Roman toilet's habits just to humiliate Jesus more and more and more. 
This shows you the cruelty of the Roman soldier. This shows you the cruelty of the Roman Empire and how corrupt they were. Let's continue reading from verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Look what John speaks in 1930. John chapter 19 verse 30. Then he had received the drink. Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, the correct translation in Hebrew, it says, not it is finished. It says finished only, means done, means complete. As if Jesus is saying, my mission on earth is complete. Yes, he has accomplished all that his father sent him to earth to do. Look what is written in Luke chapter 34 verse 46. Finally, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Jesus completely commits his life in the hands of the Father. He is confident that God will restore it to him with complete trust in God. Christ bows his head and dies. Look what happened at the same moment. A violent earthquake occurs, splitting the rock on the temple. It is so powerful that tombs outside Jerusalem break open and corpses are thrown out of them. And people saw the dead bodies exposed. Look what is written in the book of Matthew 27, 51 to 53. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus resurrected and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When Jesus dies, the long, heavy curtain that divides the holy from the holy of holies in the temple was ripped into two parts from top to bottom, which means the plan of salvation of humanity took place. There is no more holy of holies. Everyone can go and talk to God because the Son has been sacrificed and the Son has saved humanity by his own blood. No more sacrifices. Jesus was the last sacrifice. There are so many symbolisms of Passover and Jesus. Let me tell you some points of it. The sacrifice lamb should be a male. Second, the sacrifice lamb should be the firstborn. You always give the first to God. Jesus was the firstborn to Mary. Number three, no broken legs. You have to give a complete healthy sacrifice. And when the Romans approached Jesus to broke his legs because they don't want him to be on the cross a long time, he was already dead, so he was complete. Number four, the blood properly drained. Okay, Jesus has shed a lot of blood. So the sacrifice, you should drain all the blood from the sacrifice to present it to God complete. Number five, darkness. In Egypt also, darkness for three days. On the cross, darkness, three hours. And remember the hyssop on a stick. Also in Egypt, the hyssop on a stick on the doorposts on the houses and the last one number seven Passover lamp was sacrificed in the temple in the ninth hour at 3 p.m. and Jesus died in the ninth hour exactly at 3 p.m. this is when the high priest go and sacrifice the lamb and what's written on Friday at 3 p.m., a Roman soldier stuck his sword into his thigh to see if he was still alive. If not, okay. If yes, they have to break his leg and knees to cause him to die faster. But Jesus was already dead. 
The Romans did not want criminals to hang for a long time on the cross, and they wanted to bury him before Shabbat came down. When Jesus was stabbed, he was already dead. Jesus had been scourged before going on the cross. No doubt that made him die faster because he was so exhausted. But the other two thieves on the cross, by the way, they're not thieves. The translation say thieves. They are zealots. They are Jews against the Roman government. They were still alive. And when Jesus died, people were so afraid. Look what the army officer, the centurion in charge of the execution, had said. Verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. He may have been there at Jesus' trial also before Pilate, the same centurion, when the issue of the divine sonship was discussed. Now he is convinced that Jesus is righteous and in fact the Son of God. Let's continue verse 55 and 56. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalena, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Among those observing at a distance are many female disciples who at times traveled with Jesus. They too are deeply moved by all these events. And they were thinking, why did you leave us alone? They were so sad and depressed and crying. Why did you leave us? Jesus, why did you leave us? God, why did you leave us? But it's only their own feelings. Jesus left them for a reason, because he will resurrect again. And after all of this explanation, I can see that the people in the group are tearing up. So I will tell them I will give you half an hour and to go and visit the Holy Sepulchre Church. And this is the traditional recognized site of Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And I give them some historical information about the Holy Sepulchre because they're sitting down and facing it. And I want to change a little bit the atmosphere. And I tell them it was first built by Emperor Constantine in 326 AD. And the structure that is standing today is more or less from the Crusader period, 11th century, and much more smaller than the original church built by Constantine in the 4th century. And... I tell them it's not what you expect usually when you enter the holiest Christian site in the world. You will be surprised because when you enter the church, there are so many denominations sharing this church and it's divided. And there are six different denominations, three major and three minor. The major ones, the big ones are the Roman Catholics, the Greek Orthodox and the Armenians. The three minor ones are the Syrian Orthodox, the Coptics, and the Ethiopians. And conflict over space over the years led to something called the Statico Agreement in 1856, which prevented any major changes or renovations in any part of the church unless all the denominations agreed upon it. And during history to prevent any further clashes, the keys to the church have been in the hands of two Muslim families, the Nusebe family and the Jude family, for centuries, and they alone have the privilege of locking and unlocking the gate of the Holy Sepulchre daily. And I tell the group the entrance to the church is free of charge and open to anyone from any background or religion. And... It's one of the most crowded visited sites in Israel. And the only restrictions upon entering the church, they are very strict. You should have a modest dress, meaning shoulders covered and 
any trousers or shorts below the knees. The knees should be covered to respect that place. So also, you have to be very flexible as large numbers of peoples or processions or masses or communion may limit your access to inside the church. It's a very, very busy church. And I suggest for them first to go up to the right side upon entering the church to visit Calvary. This is the first site you should see. And it's up steep and narrow steps to go to Golgotha. And be aware that these steps may be difficult for some, depending on the individuals of the group, and they are very steep. And up the stairs is the traditional site of the crucifixion and the death of Christ. And there is always a queue of people waiting to touch the tip of the hill located under the altar. You're going to see a round shape, circle, bronze color drawing. And inside there's a hole so people can touch the top of Golgotha. It's very deep and very symbolic. And once you finish that, go back down the steps and proceed and pass by the anointing stone and go to the left side to the rotunda. And this is where it's called the sepulcher, holy sepulcher, the rotunda, the holy tomb is located there. And there is a, always a long line to enter the tomb. And uh, if you want to see the tomb, it's like between one to three hours wait. And if you like to visit the tomb, it's your own choice. And I give them the complete freedom and I tell them just, everyone knows the hotel, this is the last thing we've done today. And I'm going to go back to the hotel in half an hour. So after half an hour, if you're done with the church, you can meet me at the steps where we are sitting right now. If not, you want to stay more, uh, you can stay and you can go and walk back to the hotel by yourself. By this time, this is day number eight. So they know their surroundings. They know well, where is the location of the hotel and they know a little bit part of the old city. And to my surprise, everyone is back earlier. <laughs> they visited the church so quick. And I will tell them, if you got lost, there's only one entrance and one exit. So everyone will come earlier on time. And we go back to the hotel because the group is so exhausted. After this day number eight, we walked and we finished completely the last day of Jesus in Jerusalem. So let me give you a summary. What did the group do? They started on the Mount of Olives, went down, walking to the Dominus Flavia Church. And from there, we get all the way back to Mount Zion, the upper room, and then walked from there all the way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And from the Garden of Gethsemane, walked through the Kidron Valley to the Peter and Galicanto Church, the house of the high priest Caiaphas. And from there, we walked all the way up to Jaffa Gate, to the something called Herod's Palace. And then from there, we walked to the Holy Sepulcher. So that was a long day of walking, like five hours. And I can see on the faces of the people, they are so tired, they are so exhausted, that they cannot receive more information. And I myself is so tired because of walking. But I want them to feel how Jesus walked and to follow his footsteps in the last day of his life in Jerusalem. And we are, and we achieved it, and we've done it all. And I was impressed that all the people in the group followed me and wanted to do the walk with no complaints. So they were stretched, they were very flexible, but at the same time, they're very tired. But they are so much content because now they understand more and they felt the tiredness and they felt like how Jesus was really suffering and in pain walking and they were able to understand more about Jesus and his last day in Jerusalem. This is very deep for them. So they're very happy. They're very content 
and we are heading back to the bus to have dinner and I told them tomorrow we will not start early tomorrow will start at 10 o'clock because I want them to rest because I can't push them and push them and push them all the time but I want them to rest tomorrow that they can have late breakfast and wake up and rest like one or more two hours because I see how much they're exhausted and then we will start tomorrow at the garden tomb and speak about the resurrection of Jesus.